is William Hopley, your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I welcome you to another Two Hats special of community events. Let's look in and see what's really happening. And good afternoon and welcome to Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet and I am here in the studio with the late Patty Fink. Uh, the not late Laurent Landis is running late because he's having heart trouble, but he probably won't even get in here today. So the late Laurent Landis will be here next week. Is that clear? <laughs> we hope. We hope, <laughs> yes. It's just car trouble. He's fine. Um, and it's best when car trouble happens at home. Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah. Anyway, our guest today is Dan Wood. He is running for an open seat for Congress. It's Jeb Pensterling's uh, district. It's Patty Fink's district. Yes, it is. Uh, and it's Lance Gooden, uh, who's the opponent. And if he would like to come on the show and um, and present his side of the story, we'd love to have him on, too. But today we have Dan Wood. He's uh, running uh, for district... District 5. District 5. You know, the numbers are just mishmash for Congress, aren't they? They are. And I'd just like to say before we get started, um, we have an awful lot of candidates on this cycle, mm -hmm. um, and none of their opponents want to come on an LGBT, the oldest, longest running LGBT yeah, show in the country. I but don't we're know inviting, why. We're inviting them. We're, we're inviting them. We're inviting them, and they're that's, not coming. That's the I way we imagine are. imagine that. It's just... So, Dan, you're not afraid of us? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thanks, David. <laughs> Before the show, actually, he said he has some LGBT uh, relatives, uh, some people in his family. Um, so he's actually met some of us and found out we're not that scary. <laughs> well, Patty is, but... Yeah. <laughs> um, as you've been campaigning uh, through your district, and the district starts in East Dallas at Patty's house. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much, it does. And we're the, like the westernmost precinct. And goes through Mesquite and down into Kaufman County and Henderson County uh, and out to Van Zandt County and... Even Anderson and Cherokee County, part of Wood County. So the heaviest voting is in Dallas and Mesquite? Oh, yes. Mesquite's the largest city in the district. Um, but the Lakewood area, uh, Lake Highlands, um, those people are motivated. And lots of votes in that area. That's good to hear. Um, what are you hearing as you're walking through the district? Well, um, of course, I met Patty last year as part of uh, working with the funky East Dallas Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, They've been on our show. A AKA a the Fed. Uh -huh. And so um, uh, that group is on fire and have uh, canvassed. Uh, thousands and thousands of houses and apartments in that area, mm -hmm. and um, the uh, those are the folks that are going to make the blue wave happen that we're all counting on. Um, as you're walking through your district, and we'll go into this through the show, what are some of the uh, main issues that people are telling you concern them? Well, uh, for my district, I I believe the main issue is access to health care. Um, uh, we have a district that is uh, very diverse, obviously, because of the rural part and then the urban part of our district. But folks in the rural part of our district uh, really need access to health care. Uh, my wife has a pre-existing condition. Um, she has the opportunity to get the ACA insurance, which in our county, home county, only one company offers the ACA insurance coverage with pre-existing condition coverage. Hmm. So, um, well, it, all insurance is supposed to have pre cover pre-existing conditions now, though. Well, no, um, only if it's ACA qualified. And so, oh. um, with the Republicans in power now, um, the ACA is under attack and, we and weakened um, as often as they can. Hmm. It's um it's surprising to me how uh, when the rubber meets the road and people try to get health care insurance that they don't um, well I, a majority of Americans do support the ACA. Um, it's shocking to me that Republicans don't. And mm -hmm. imagine the federal dollars. It's got to be billions by now 
that Texas has turned down mm -hmm. because they want to expand Medi Medicaid. Right. It's and just it, insane. And that's that's an issue that has probably cost many people uh, their lives mm -hmm. uh, that uh, needlessly died earlier than they should have um, because that simply not taking the Medicaid expansion was um, our Republican governor saying it's got Obama's name on it and therefore we don't want it. Do you know one thing I've suggested to a couple of people in Congress that I've talked to? I've said that the Democrats should introduce a bill that repeals Obamacare and replaces it with the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> <laughs> well, you think I'm kidding. If you poll people, every poll shows people hate Obamacare, but they love the Affordable Care Act, and by 20 or so points, um, 20 points more of people like the Affordable Care Act who don't like Obamacare. So that, that's my solution. Um, right. Well, yeah. that, that may be a good idea, David. Uh, uh, you get, we should look th at that. Think about that. You, yeah. you really should look at that when, uh, if you get into Congress. Um, you did not get the Dallas Morning News endorsement. Um, Mark Ferris got it this week. Kendall Scudder, they've both been on our show. Um, Mark is in a Republican district, and he got the Morning News endorsement. You know, and he's like the marriage equality candidate. Uh, but, but you know, but I, you're well, Dan. You're qualified, but too strident. <laughs> right. Um, I, I, I appreciated the Dallas Morning News saying that I was qualified uh, mm -hmm. to be congressman for this district, um, but I was too strident, I suppose, because I'm not willing to just talk in monotones about. Um, the dangers that we face from this current Republican administration in areas of health care, economics, and immigration. And so um, uh, I think I probably lost the Dallas Morning News when I uh, told them that I thought Trump's strategy on the southern border was uh, straight up racism. And, uh, Isn't that what Beto's saying, too? Uh -huh. and, and I wasn't, you know, and I wasn't nice about it. Uh, so um, if if that's being too strident, I'll wear that label proudly. And they, you know, they're saying that that um, it was something I mentioned, and it was that you know you're you didn't fit with East Texas, and I think that's just bullpucky. Okay, I, I think there's a lot of people in okay in Patty, District Five. Who your absolutely district, agree with your you. district. You're on the western edge of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but you're part of that district. Yes. Where do you live, Tim? I live in Coffin County on the eastern side on the family farm. You know, I, I don't know what to say about that. How can you fit in more into that district? Well, I've lived there all my life. You're right. Um, and I believe, um, you know, one of the things I'd like to do in Congress is get on the Ag Committee. Uh, I've got a lot of experience in, in farming, uh, cattle raising, hay production. Uh, that's what the farm is used for today. So um, uh, I do know. You don't use your farm for tax breaks? <laughs> no, it's it's an actual working farm. Uh, my uncle uh, operates the farm now, but um, uh, I think that I identify well with the people in in my eastern part of my district. Uh, I grew up going to the the local cattle market on Saturday mornings with my uncle, and it was always a big day to do that. And and even now, I enjoy watching the hay being baled and the customers coming to load up and head out with the product from my community. It's called Cobb Switch. So, uh, you know, we're the economic engine of Cobb Switch. <laughs> That's awesome. God, he's strident. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can bring this down a notch. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's... I, I do think it's kind of funny because you know, several years ago, um, I went out with a with my company. We were going to do an event at South Fork, and as we pull into the the planning part of it, we pull in under the the big gate at the front where it says South Fork across the top. And I asked the twenty one year old who was setting things up. I said, "Is this who a working?" Who wasn't born when that show was on the air? Exactly. But, and I said, okay. "I said, um, was this a working ranch?" And she goes, "Oh yeah, they have parties and events here all the time." <laughs> High contrast to what Dan's really talking about was, yeah. which is nitty gritty farming. <laughs> I have a I have a barbecue grill we use occasionally. Uh -huh. Awesome! That's why you have people... parties and events at your farm. <laughs> <laughs> so it is working. But uh, I want to go back to healthcare a little bit. Um, people are you said are having 
trouble in your district getting health care, uh, that if you have pre-existing conditions in Kaufman County, there's only one insurance company that's right. available. Um, what about the rest of the district? Are, what are you hearing? Is it well, about the same thing in all the other of the, rural counties? Uh, counties in my district, um, except for maybe Dallas County, uh, there's there's almost just one choice available. Um, of course, um, I have several ideas that I'd like to take to Congress to increase availability of uh, access to health care. Um, I've always said that access to health insurance is not the same as access to health care. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a problem we need to to do uh, uh, work on. But um, until we get a Democratic majority in the House and Senate, and maybe yeah, nothing is going to be amended to the right. uh, to the Affordable Care Act to right. you make know, it I, work better. I think we need a public option in the health marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, we need a, an ability to buy into Medicare uh, at an earlier age than 65. Know, this was one I of my suggestions. At 60, my health care, my health insurance skyrocketed. I mean, it doubled uh, going from 59 to 60. So if 60 to 65 is an age group that is expensive for insurance companies, because I would never accuse insurance companies of just gouging. Never. <laughs> um, and you know me, Patty. I, yeah. I, I, I'm very reasonable when it comes to my insurance uh, and talking about my insurance company, <laughs> which I no longer have. I'm so delighted. Um, if 60 to 65 is the most expensive for insurance companies to carry, and Medicare needs more people in the Medicare pool, that would be the least expensive for them to cover. How about just easing into Medicare for all by doing Medicare for everybody 60 and above? Well, um, I think that's very reasonable. I, I may, or am I being too strident? Yeah, you could be. <laughs> um, but uh, I had proposed uh, 55. That was one of Secretary Clinton's ideas. You know, I'm even. I saying, love that idea. Well, I'm even saying let's bring it down a few years first, and then we can go down to 55, and and let's see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Well, you we've got to do something. Yeah. I mean, we're going to have people dying out in the east part of my district because they can't get access to health care. Their only access to health care is to show up at the emergency room when it's probably too late to uh, do any long term care. Mm -hmm. Um, so people are avoiding uh, going to the doctor uh, and discovering whether or not they have cancer or some other condition that needs treatment. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's it's too late often for people in my district by the time they get to see a health care provider. And a lot of the times I've been hearing a lot of stories about not just in Texas but in most of the states where the Republican governors didn't take the the Medicaid expansion and the federal dollars that came with it. Lots of rural hospitals are having to close because they're not able to maintain the revenue they need um, it, on a year-round basis to stay open. Mm -hmm. So that's I mean that's a that's a big problem. But talk about access to health care if there's no hospital within driving distance. Mm -hmm. We were we were visiting um, Eureka Springs in Arkansas. A couple of years ago, and people there were talking about we're kind of like scouting it out. Maybe we want to retire someplace like that. They said the only place you can you just get airlifted out and go 40 miles by helicopter mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. to healthcare, yeah. and that's not an unusual. I mean, they're mountainous, and so you'd have to do helicopters. But you, at the same time, you know, we have kind of planes out in East Texas, and you'd have to drive or fly a long way mm -hmm. in some cases to um, to get to healthcare. And if your EMTs or your paramedics are not the top notch, you might not make it. Mm -hmm. You know. Well. <laughs> Uh, think about all the the women uh, expecting babies that have to be concerned about whether they're going to make it to the hospital or not in right. time when the time comes. I don't care nothing about birth and no babies. <laughs> <laughs> we, I, I've been I've known that for years. <laughs> um, it, it, there, there's so much wrong with uh, w with that uh, and with not taking the Medicare expansion though or Medicaid expansion expansion uh, it, it would have just covered a number more people I mean I, I know a lot of people who are in that 
donut hole that uh, they make too much to qualify for Medicaid as it is, don't make enough to qualify to purchase uh, ACA insurance. So, I know a big issue um, at, the, at the state level, but I think Congress could have a, a part in this. A, a big issue I'm hearing from rural areas is um, access to, to broadband internet mm -hmm. and easy access. To, can you walk through real quick about what it takes to be online in East Texas? Well, um, like say you got a phone. Right. Where I'm, where I'm located, where I live, we use the hotspot on our cell phones. Wow. Um, so now, you live near Terrell. It, I live 11 miles east of Terrell. Okay, that's 45 minutes from downtown Dallas mm -hmm. at most. Right. We're not talking about way out in the country. We're talking about it's just over there. Right. I go shopping in Terrell sometimes at the outlet malls. It would be impossible for me to telecommute from where I live. Uh, and and I couldn't start a business uh, out in the country because I don't have access to reliable Internet. So uh, early on in this campaign, um, April of last year, 2017, I contacted our uh, local a rural electric cooperative and we talked about the issues involved with providing the infrastructure for broadband to uh, rural customers much like was done in the 1930s for rural electrification um, and so Patty while, talks about that from her childhood all the okay. time <laughs> yeah you remember that well absolutely okay. absolutely why can't uh, you get internet through your phone lines like we do with AT and T? Um, well, you can get um, you can get a dial up, of course. Uh, no, I'm talking about landline. I'm talking about um, Wi Fi, like but DSL, well, the, the DSL that, that's coming through our phone lines, or is that actually a different line that right, they? Well, the the lines haven't been laid yet. Um, okay. and, and even if there are some areas with access to DSL, it's a very slow DSL. Mm. It's not uh, fast enough to support uh, streaming uh, media. Mm. Uh, so um, I, I know there are some rural areas that have access to DSL. Mm. Um, there are satellite providers that you can purchase, but those uh, speeds are not high enough to support media streaming either. That's just wild to people who live in an urban mm -hmm. city like us. Well, we can't use Roku or Netflix any of those or, services. Yeah. That's that's pretty amazing. Hmm. I, wow. You know, companies like Netflix are big enough. I'm surprised they're not the ones who are campaigning for better access in rural areas. So, well, I would hope to enlist them as as um, allies. Mm -hmm. You know, when we get to Congress, sure. because. I mean, my, uh, the CEO of the Trinity Valley Electric Co-op that I am served by was more than willing to work with Congress um, in the FEC to um, to you know expand uh, access to internet. Hmm. It's just it's not economically feasible for them to do it with their members' money. Yeah, you know, I'm surprised. Dallas suburbs are bumping out towards Terrell right now, mm -hmm. real quickly. I'm surprised that that's, when we talk about rural, that that's included in it. We need to take a break. You're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON FM. I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with the late Patty Fink. And David just admitted he was over 60. Yeah, I did. It's over 65, actually. So this is uh -huh. Landmark Day. And, and yeah, I went on, he is, I, I went on Medicare out. this month. I'm delighted with it. Uh, <laughs> it's saving me $1,000 a month in health insurance costs. Just note that he's not 35 for the 18th time. Facebook will only let you change your birth year a certain number of times. <laughs> um, we'll be back with more. Uh, Dan Wood is running for... Uh, uh, Congress, uh, Texas District Number 5, and we'll be back with more with Dan right after this. This is Rollins Gellin, and I'm listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3, and darn glad to be doing it. And welcome back to Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with the late Patty Fink, and our guest is Dan Wood. He's running for Congress, U.S. House District 5. Five. Um we're just talking about some of the issues that you're running into, but one big issue that's uh, that everybody's facing this week is the confirmation hearings for Brett Kavanaugh. Um, Patty, you're excited about these hearings. 
Oh, t- oh, terribly. Yeah. Yes, terribly. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting that these same these these as I call them, 11 old white guys that the GOP put on the Senate Judiciary Committee, not one woman. Mm -hmm. And the GOP actually has a few women Mm -hmm. in the Senate. And they didn't, Mitch McConnell did not appoint any of them to to this committee at all. So these men don't want to interrogate um, Brett Kavanaugh's accuser, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. And so they're negotiating her appearance next week, but uh, they're also talking, these, these GOP senators are talking about having um, a woman staff a- attorney do the questioning. Mm-hmm. And that's, I just think that's so cowardly. It's so cowardly. If these guys cannot do, it, do the job themselves, they, shouldn't, they don't belong in the committee. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and how much congratulations we should give to Dr. Ford for her courage to step forward like she is. Um, I I'm, just can't I'm worried about her. I'm just, I just can't imagine. I, I think Anita Hill got off easy compared to what they're going to do to this woman. I think you may be right. And I, I think I agree with you, Dan, about her courage. This is to put yourself out there on a national scene when most, you know, sexual assault happens to, um, to one in four women before the age of 18 mm-hmm. and one in three in their lifetime. And that's a lot of women in this country. And... Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of discussion about why why did she wait so long. Well, if you study what happens to a woman who's been sexually assaulted, this is not unusual at all. And most people go their entire lives and don't report mm-hmm. it. It's the most underreported crime there is. And so for her to step up now and, and to talk about something so painful, and one of the things that strikes me is she told peers at the time, mm-hmm that it had occurred. And she'd been going to counseling. And she'd been going to counseling now for years. She, um, there's one reference that she'd been in counseling in 2012 and had, you know, uh, contemporaneously in 2012 recounted that she had been sexually assaulted by a federal judge. And, and so this, is, this kind of like goes back to the whole birther thing. It's like, what, did she plan it so early on mm-hmm. that she was going to one day accuse somebody in the <laughs> national forum? Mm-hmm. Because it's, yes. you don't do that. Oh, yes, she did. You know, you just, you just don't do that. She's putting it out there. And like, why would you put yourself out and beg for an FBI investigation if it was all a big lie? Mm-hmm. Because you know, lying to the FBI is a federal crime, and you go to prison. Well, one thing I found interesting about this is we learned that the FBI doesn't do investigations. That's what that's what the, the so-called president said. Mm-hmm. You know it, that that's not their thing, even right. though the third letter in their name is <laughs> investigation. Right. Right. You know, I, I've learned um, how to use Twitter in my at my age, and mm-hmm. uh, I've, I've become quite the uh, expert at it. I hope. Uh, but I've been following the hashtag uh, why I didn't report mm-hmm. and the stories are uh, are so amazing and uh, truly enlightening uh, as to uh, all of the things that are going through uh, people's minds who have been sexually assaulted um, so um, it is just uh, it, it's just amazing how deaf the Republican Party is to uh, people who have suffered as victims, and now uh, since they're engrossed in getting their candidate, their appointee on the Supreme Court, because they have a much broader agenda that they right. want to um, enforce, uh, that they're willing to walk over anybody, mm-hmm. including Dr. Ford. And I really hope that Dr. Ford is going to uh, be able to uh, talk to the country in a way that helps us understand her experience and why Brett Kavanaugh is not the right candidate for the Supreme Court. I, I hope she gets Secret Service protection. That's the level that I think we've sunk to. She's been getting death threats. She's been... She had to leave her home. She had to leave her home because uh, of, of the threats and, and threats against her children. What kind of people do that? Mm-hmm. This is, it's really insane to me. And Kavanaugh, you know, has bragged about his, you know, prowess in, in high school and his, um, you know, blackout, to the point of blackout 
drinking parties and such in, in high school. And Is it possible that could explain why he doesn't remember the incident? I absolutely believe that. He could have absolutely been done the act, not remember it, and she's telling the truth, and he's telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Uh, because he doesn't remember it. And his his pal, who was a witness, she named it as a witness, who said, oh, I, don't, I don't want to come and say that under oath that I, what, that I don't remember it. Um, she's, you know, he had written a book about how, <laughs> how drunk they were in high mm -hmm. school. And I don't know. I, I, th I think she needs to have her say, and we need to be respectful of that. And the Republicans would be would do well to remember what happened with Anita Hill, the way they treated her so shabbily See, and, and Patty, so disgracefully. Patty, you're still thinking she's going to get a fair hearing. No, no, no. I, I have no, I'm not. no... No, no. What I'm saying is, when if we look back at Anita Hill and the country and women, and we're 51% of the population, watched what happened to Anita Hill... And that was in 1990, the fall of 1991. And in 1992, the very next year in November, we went from one woman in the U.S. Senate to six. And it was considered the year of the woman. Mm -hmm. And in the House, we went from 33 women to 55 women. They were pissed off. I was pissed off. I remember that. That whole episode with Anita Hill. And do they realize now just how many women are on the ballot in November? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like... Go ahead and piss off 51% of the, right. of the country. Well, the Republicans are a gift that keep on giving for our midterms, you know. And, uh -huh. um, yeah. <laughs> I hate the damage that's being done, but uh, I really hope it gets folks' attention. The, the turnout is so important for the midterms. And I was going to ask you, what is your strategy to win? It's basically a Republican district or has been for, uh, for, for a while. Um, but you didn't go into this thinking, oh, well, the Democrats need somebody to run, so I might as well. Well, you, David, you in, in with the strategy. We don't know how this district is going to go. Um, the, there hasn't been a Democrat run for this seat since 2012. Mm -hmm. um, Jim Henserling has been the sitting congressman since 2002. Um, after the election in 2016, I decided I'm not going to sit back anymore and wait. I'm going to oppose every Republican um, on the ballot uh, possible. And I got other folks to run. Um, and I stepped up myself, my little group in uh, our little Democratic group in Terrell. Uh, I told them in March of 17, if they'd raise $5,000 for me, I would announce as a candidate for Congress. And by the way, I hate that money seems to be everything for a congressional race. But, but you got to know you can get it. But in, you know. in 19 days, that small group of people who are not millionaires, who work every day for a living or even live on Social Security, raised that $5,000. And that told me that they wanted a choice in November of, of this year. So You know, and we're talking about money. You're not taking PAC money. You're not taking um, big corporate dollars. Um, but $5,000 barely is going to pay for your gas to get across your district is a large district. It paid for my filing fee, is what it paid for. So uh, we have been able to raise some more money. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly can't match my opponent in his ability to raise money. We weren't going to be able to match Jim Henserling, certainly. Uh, he had millions in his campaign account ready to go mm -hmm. against any serious challenger. Uh, but with him announcing his retirement in an open seat, I believe this district can turn blue. And so what is your strategy? It's a get out of the vote strategy, isn't it? Well, it is. It's uh, on the ground, boots on the ground, get people to the polls. We're not only asking people uh, when we call them on the phone or knock on their doors, are you going to vote? Are you going to vote Democratic? We're asking them, when can we pick you up and take you to the polls? And so we have uh, dozens of drivers who have already volunteered to help us with that effort in all counties of the district. Um, do you have any problem in any of your rural counties with polling places that are just nowhere near where anybody lives? Well, um, I can really only speak for Kaufman County, um, but uh, we've recently gone to what are called voting centers for Election Day mm -hmm. so that you can vote at any polling location oh. regardless of your precinct number. Um, but many rural Texas counties have not done that. So it's a problem getting to the polls. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's just impossible for people with uh, sufficient money to live without care about 
where the money is going to come from. It's hard for them to understand that you can't just gas up your, whip out your credit card, gas up your SUV, and go vote. Um, folks need to be uh, uh, feel like they have access to the polls, and there's also an intimidation factor for many minorities in mm -hmm. my district that we think we can help alleviate by actually taking people to the polls. Mm. Now, this started out as a, uh, and you were you were stepping up to run against Jeb Pensferling, and then of course he he looked across the, the scene, checked the horizon, and said, "I'm not doing this again." And, and kind of bailed. And so it was an open seed and there was a big shimmy on the other side, on the on the GOP side to, to pick somebody to run against you. Um, and this is a completely different race than when you started out. Because you know you know Lance Gooden. Oh yeah, and Lance and I are both from Terrell. Mm -hmm. um, he actually was in my daughter's high school class. Really? So we've, uh, we've known each other a long time. Uh, it's he's amazing. unknown to you. Yeah, he, he's, uh, it's amazing that Terrell has never had a congressman before, but we're going to have one this year. So, um, but uh, when Jeb Hensling was the opponent, it was with w eyes wide open, we knew it was a difficult race to win. But that all changed. And it's changing every day. Things have continued to happen, one of which is Beto. Mm -hmm. uh, Beto has energized the base like no one else. Um, it just so happens he's number one on your ballot, mm -hmm. and I'm number two. Yep. So uh, it's not going to be hard to find me on the ballot this year. I think that's really spectacular. Um, and, and with so many people, um, you know, energized, are you finding that in the rural areas too? He's oh, yeah. We uh, early on uh, started working with uh, Democratic groups we could find in the eastern part of the county, and we, we were uh, successful in finding a lot. Uh, so many uh, have now said that I was afraid I was the only one out here. But uh, so many of these Democratic groups in the eastern counties of the district have started coming forward and helping with the campaign in a way that's exciting. We're doing events on uh, a daily basis out in, in both ends of the district. And um, uh, I, I'm, I'm very gratified all the work the volunteers have done. I know some a, a lesbian couple out in... Um I believe it's Franklin County. Uh, had they they got a group together of about a dozen women, and they went to the primary to vote. And they had to go to a, you know a location where there were both Republicans and, and Democrats. And they asked for a Democratic ballot, and the women working the location just about freaked out. And what you want a Democratic ballot? And they. <laughs> Said yeah, and they had to go hunt, you know, hunt through the materials to find the Democratic ballots, and they said we need twelve of them, mm -hmm. and they just went, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it, it was an intimidation uh, effort that um, the poll workers in the eastern counties would ask you out loud to state whether or not you wanted a Democratic or a Republican ballot. So you had to out yourself uh, in the presence of everyone there who you were going to, what party you were going to be voting for. Do you, so, do you know, I, I lived in Oak Cliff for years, and a white person coming up to the poll at the um, uh, sub-courthouse, white person coming up, all of a sudden, you'd see the Republican sitting there, her eyes would open, Republican? And, uh, you know, I just kind of shake my head. Right. And they were like, they were so disappointed. <laughs> just dashed, I'm sure. <laughs> because they're... They just didn't get much business on on that side. So, right. what I think is interesting is the way this this and they're all gerrymandered. We know this they're, that they're terribly ger gerrymandered districts. But there's a swath of East Dallas County, which includes um, Mesquite largely and a lot of East Dallas and and such in your district. And really, those votes, um, those votes alone, would you know basically bump up against all the other votes put together. That you could get from the other counties right well um i feel confident about winning in dallas county portion of my district but it's just a question of how large am i going to win in dallas yeah. county so you need to get a good portion of dallas county volume. in your district to vote for you to overcome some of the We're republican, the traditional yeah. republican yeah. vote in the eastern counties yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so um i, I really think that well, we've identified 27 voting precincts in Dallas County that have over half the vote we need 
to win this election. Wow. And so we are working to get those folks to the polls. And this isn't just saying everyone who's registered in the district. These are precincts that have experience with Democrats voting. So um, mm-hmm. our strategy is, is really laser focused to get those precincts to vote where we've identified that Democratic vote. We need to take a break in just a minute, but uh, whenever we have somebody on uh, running for legislature or Congress, I like to ask them. No, we didn't used to have to ask this question, but I think it's become important. Do you believe in science? Absolutely, (laughs) David. (laughs) So so you'll vote for like bills that are like medical research and things like that? Correct, and I believe that global warming is an actual scientific fact. An actual fact, huh? Just because we had the warmest summer or one of the five warmest summers in, in history this year, and uh, and what was it, seven inches of rain over the weekend? Oh, it was it massive. A record amount of rain that came from nowhere? Um, where, where did that rain come from even? I mean, it... I don't it know. It wasn't a hurricane that blew it's in. It's probably so. from somewhere in the West where they're using a lot of water to put the fires out. <laughs> or, or they're using a lot of water to, uh, 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 to bury the chemicals from the fracking. Um. Well, hay is going to be expensive this year out in my neck of the woods because uh, army worms thrive in wet weather Mm. and so we've had an epidemic of army worms attacking the hay fields in east texas so a lot of farmers are not going to get their third cutting and so we're going to have you know who i blame that on obama okay (laughs) (laughs) you're listening to lambda weekly on 89.3 kno and fm i'm dave taffet here in the studio with the late patty fink and our guest is dan wood he's running for district five for u.s congress Hi, this is Valetta Lil, and I listen to Lambda Weekly. I hope that you will, too. And this is Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with the late Patty Fink. I guess Laurent never did get his car started because he's not here. No, it's not. Uh, he'll be back with us next week. Um, we are talking to Dan Wood. He's running for uh, Congress, uh, Texas District 5. Right. Right. Texas CD5. CD, Congressional District 5. Yes. Right, that's the words I was trying to get to. U.S. Congress. Um, and it's the seat that Jeb Henserling currently holds uh, running against Lance Gooden. And once again, if uh, Lance would like to come on the show, he's perfectly welcome to. Um, as you've been walking around your district, you told us before the show that a couple of the uh, issues that you're hearing uh, from people, in addition to health care, economic issues and immigration. Right. Well, economic issues for our district include health care, but the jobs uh, in the eastern part of my district and probably the district wide are not um, quality jobs that pay enough money for a person to make a living working a full time job. Mm -hmm. So many people in my district work two and three jobs. Um, It's always been my belief that if you work a full time job, you shouldn't have to work uh, more than one of those jobs so uh, you shouldn't have to have an extra job so what I would uh, like to see is in addition to raising the federal minimum wage uh, we do need to uh, help uh, business and uh, small businesses uh, be able to thrive so that they can offer higher wages Um, but we need to start with um, that federal minimum wage we need to raise that um, also in the teaching profession, there are teachers in the rural districts that don't make enough money to make ends meet, although they have a college degree. They're professionals, and I like to say that uh, teaching is a calling and not about poverty. And the, the thing about uh, the teachers I've learned is that, um, well, for one, for example, I was at a restaurant, uh, got to talking to the waitress, learned she was a teacher, said, why are you working the second job? And she almost teared up saying that she has children at home she has to take care of. So that told me right then that, um, you know, it's real. People are, are not being able to make ends meet in the job market in our district. Mm-hmm. That's, really, that's really scary because we put our children's lives in the hands of teachers <coughs> excuse me, through the day to, to improve their futures. And we can't we can't give our teachers a sustainable wage. Well, and, and the time that the teacher is taking to um, to be a waitress or or take 
that second job, that's time that that teacher is not preparing for class. That's time the teacher's not grading papers. That's or time with the their teachers, kids. Uh, and, and then in addition to that, her own kids, right. right. It just frightens me that how much teachers end up, they may get you know, a pittance of a salary, and then they spend part of that pittance of a salary um, in order to do their jobs. Mm-hmm. They get stuff for their classrooms. They get supplies for kids that don't have them. They spend out of their pocket to, um, you know, to, to take care of the kids who are students in their class. And that's just wrong because it's, you know, a lot of that's the state of Texas. It's not necessarily Congress, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. And I, I can see in a rural area, that's really, really tough. I mean, right. to, to be able to make ends meet um, if you're on, in a big district where it has to be more competitive and salaries may be a little bit higher. Right, and the the difference in in uh, property values in the urban areas versus the rural areas makes mm-hmm. a difference too in the tax rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, it's tough for a lot of rural districts to make it. Um, the of course the Texas state legislature has cut funding for public schools uh, in an effort to uh, I believe to uh, make them um, not a good choice uh, for parents and to promote their idea of. Uh, vouchers uh, support for private schools so uh, I think there's an ulterior motive for defunding our public schools but uh, that's that's the great leveler uh, public schools it helps us live as a democracy and we've got to support that mm-hmm. now what, what is your how is this this new um, as we call tax um, tax bill tax reform bill that was passed in Congress how is that playing in, in your district? Well, I don't, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't think I, I've really seen uh, people in my district uh, with a tremendous amount of gain from that. Um, you know, Jeb Hensling supported that, um, but it was for his constituents on Wall Street that he supported that. Not right, for his and he's cons- a multimillionaire. Let's yes, face and it. Not, yeah. not his constituents in my district or the 5th district. So um, I think uh, people are going to learn later on that. Uh, uh, the tax cut was not as billed to them and that uh, it was a grab for the wealthy in our country to have even more wealth. Um, I feel sorry for the billionaire that needed a couple of million more, Uh, uh, but uh, there's folks in my district that need a few dollars more to make ends meet. You know, I once interviewed Jerry Springer and we were, and it was when he was planning to run for Senate. And he said, we were talking about being wealthy and, and what that means. He said, the definition of being wealthy is I can afford whatever I want. And, and tax cuts were one of the issues at that election, too. He said, I don't need a tax cut. I'm wealthy. I can afford anything I want. Right. So what do I need a tax cut for? Yeah, that's insane. We didn't need a tax cut because we are in a upswing in our economy. It was a booming economy before mm-hmm. the tax cut. Uh, economists agree that that's not a good time to do that. Um, it was just a money grab, um, you know, where we want to fund programs for uh, people um, like me that just work for a living, uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, we want to fund those programs. Uh, we saw the Republicans want to fund their programs, which is to give more money to the wealthy. So uh, one of the things I like to point out uh, that's sort of an absurdity of the tax cut is that um, the Chinese are one of the major buyers of U.S. debt Mm -hmm. uh, treasuries. Mm -hmm. And so we are financing the tax cut with a deficit and borrowing money at the from the Chinese to do so, so it, it and then tariffing and adding tariffs on top of that that right. hurt our, and our so people. It, it's just such an absurdity of, mm-hmm. of what was done, and Jeb Hensarling uh, supported that, and Lance would support that as he told the Dallas Morning News. So uh, that's just out of touch and not uh, understanding the needs of the fifth district. Mm-hmm. Now it's my understanding that your your opponent like is is hugging the leg of, of Donald Trump. Well, Pretty he, much all the way through this um, election. He, he does um, state that he supports uh, President Trump and Trump's policies. Um, he's gone so far as to post pictures of him and Donald Trump on social media. Uh, kind of funny uh, 
I, I saw where Lance recently posted uh, this past week a picture of him and Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> I'm not sure what that was about, but um, that'll grab votes for sure. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> it's obvious Lance feels uh, he's going to get elected by the Trump base in the district. I think he's going to be surprised that's not going to happen this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he might be surprised by how many others live in the district. Mm-hmm. <laughs> immigration, what are you hearing on that? Well, immigration um, is uh, an issue of great importance to many communities in my district. Uh, we've reached out to the Hispanic community across the district, uh, going to um, Fructieras, Mercados, uh, to register voters and to set up uh, places where we can take people to vote that have registered um, but they are scared to death uh, for their family and friends especially for the dreamers we made a promise to the dreamers the DACA recipients uh, that they would be okay to come out of the shadows give us their names addresses and uh, we'll take care of you and now uh, the president wants to use them as poker chips to fund an unnecessary and expensive wall so, and that's just pandering to the base, to his base. So the whole idea of a wall is a so Neanderthal to me. It, I mean, it's it's really like you know medieval to me. Like put up a wall that's gonna to protect our country. We already have a moat. Uh, we do Grand. sort of have a moat, yeah. Mm-hmm. And as Beto often points out, that wall, that quote wall that that Trump and his supporters are so adamant about isn't going to go down the middle of the Rio Grande, which is where the border is. It's going to go on somebody's ranch or farm. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to fly. It's a Texas ranch or farm. See, the other thing is, it needs to be a really tall wall to keep the planes from flying over it. True. 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 Because that is one way that you can get... Or even a ladder. Yeah. A tunnel. Right. And you know, when you talk to folks on the border whose land would, you know... Uh, be attempted to be taken by eminent domain, and they're mm-hmm. fighting that. And um, they've been there for generations. Um, but uh, nobody even considers what that would do to wildlife. Well, you know, I mean, we would lose species that rely on on the Rio Grande for their water, for water right. and they would no longer be able to get water f- to sustain them. In life, well, what about the know? farmers who use the Rio Grande for water? Right. It's the, nobody thinks beyond that. It just it baffles me. Why they they talk about this? Oh, the wall, the wall, and the Mexicans will pay for it, and Mexico will pay for it, and all this crap. They don't think this through, and it really does affect every. I mean, if you're going to do it along the entire border of Texas, which is pretty big, <laughs> right. that's taking a lot of people's land. Well, yeah, and and it's a misuse of the eminent domain powers by the Trump administration. Absolutely, for unnecessary reasons. It's not it's not going to do what they think it's going to do. First of all, there's no crisis at the border. Right. Um, the Republicans will use that mantra that there's a crisis at the border to get what they want in anti-immigrant Im- legislation. Um, when is it ever going to be secure enough so that we can talk about helping the dreamers? stay in this country or some other uh, immigration reform that leads to a path to citizenship for people that we need to be in this country. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, going back to a couple of economic issues, um, one of the things that you mentioned before the show is children living with their parents beyond the normal period of time, not moving out. They have no prospect of a place to even go to live. Right. In, in my neck of the woods, it's pretty common for adult children to continue to live with their parents because they cannot afford uh, their own separate place to live, can't afford the rent, transportation. We have no public transportation out in the eastern part of the county, so mm-hmm. our, our district. So um, uh, you see that quite often where there are multi-generations of family members living in one home. Uh, very common in East Texas. And that's simply folks dealing with the lack of money Mm -hmm. Um, and they're just used to it and they think it's a way of life and I think it's time to demand um, the chance to have a living wage so that you can support yourself and what about payday lending that was another oh well that's one of the and we only have a couple minutes so you're gonna make me too strident David because (laughs) uh, payday lending is an attempt to 
take advantage of the most vulnerable mm -hmm. financially in tech in our district. Jeff Hensling was on the financial uh, uh, services committee as chair, and his uh, he he took money from those payday lenders, title loan lenders, PACs, uh, to support their agenda to make it easier to take advantage of those folks. And that's just wrong. It's immoral. And once, I'm sorry. And, and you were saying it's a big problem in rural areas. It's a big problem across South Dallas, West Dallas, any of the poorer areas of the city, too. Well, um, and, and that, that industry is designed to make money off the backs of the financially vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And um, there used to be a time when we thought that we should control financial institutions and not allow them to take advantage of us that way. I intend to support that when I go to Congress. We're gonna strengthen the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Mm -hmm not dismantle it. Yeah. I think that's really that's really important. I just we have a few minutes left. Uh, just a quick item. You were you were elected to office already in Terrell. So in your background, you've already been you've held public office before. Well, I I served on the Terrell City Council as a council member as well as a mayor pro tem. Uh, but I've always been interested in politics. I've also run for other offices, uh, most recently the Court of Appeals in Dallas in 2012 which I thought we came remarkably close to yes, you did. without uh, any resources. So, <laughs> um, uh, And so I do enjoy politics. Um, I, I look forward to serving in Congress. I think I'm ready for it. Um, certainly not intimidated by it. So uh, bring it on. And, and real quick, your barbecue story, you have the oh, missing well, barbecue. Aunt Kate has the best barbecue uh, between Wills Point and Elmo, um, where I live. Um, the little community of um, Elmo, um, it, close to where I live. Um, is this like the same name as the Bert and Ernie Elmo? Uh, it is. <laughs> I, I, it's a little railroad community, but Aunt Kate started a barbecue place right there um, on the side of the road on Highway 80, and I used to stop there often. Uh, and she had a little drive-up window, not a drive-through window. You drive up and then you back out. But um, uh, she um, closes up occasionally to go visit relatives in Chicago. And so I've been waiting for her to reopen, but it's been some weeks now, so I'm starting to get a little worried. Yeah, maybe a little, a little edgy because you need your barbecue fix. Right, right. <laughs> I, I think this is a job for the Federal Bureau of, of they don't do investigations. Yeah. So yeah. we can't ask them to help. Um, Dan Wood, too strident. You heard the show, right? Mm -hmm. Has this really been a strident, uh, you know? Um, I, I, if this has been strident, then um, I, I think you're strident on the right things. Mm -hmm. Um, but it hasn't been a strident show. David gets very strident. Mm -hmm. If we wanted, yeah. You know. Could you imagine the the morning news interviewing me? <laughs> but what I've heard but, about a lot of these a lot of these um, endorsements through the Dallas Morning News is a lot of Republicans aren't even showing up. Right. We've been a lot of Democrats who showed up, and then yeah, the Republicans. Mark Ferris told me that this week that yeah. his opponent Angela Paxton didn't show up, but they got her on the phone. For all of us here at Lambda Weekly, who is our guest next week? Mm. Yeah, I don't remember either. Uh, so we'll post it online. Look for us on Facebook, and you'll uh, you can always get who our next guest is. Dan, thank you very much for being with us. Thank Thanks so for much for being here. Uh, this is great. Running for Congress, uh, CD four, uh, five. Five. five, five, five from five. Uh, like, it's not a hard number to remember. <laughs> I've got it wrong all. It's because all you're sixty-five. Something like that. <laughs> yes. Uh, see you next week. <laughs>